Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, and today's lecture is on Kate Chopin's very short story, The Story of an Hour. Now, I suspect that if you are here, it is because you either love literature, you need help or clarification with the story, or you're just seeking out an additional analysis of it. If that is the case, then please subscribe to my channel because I post weekly lectures on canonical or classic literature that aims to help you further understand it. Now, the story of an hour is best understood through a feminist lens in that it calls out patriarchal standards in marriage that restricted women. Our narrator tells the story from Louise Mallard's point of view, and we as readers are expected to empathize with the feelings of relief and joy that she feels upon hearing that her husband has died in a train accident. Now, it's important that we not mistakenly read Mrs. Mallard as a heartless woman. After all, it is a bit shocking that a spouse would feel joy at the news of someone's death. But remember, she does weep over Mr. Mallard with sudden, wild abandonment, and she endures a storm of grief. The other thing we must not do is misread this story as a condemnation of an abusive or a cruel, unloving husband. It might be easy to jump to this conclusion since Mrs. Mallard feels liberation and delight upon hearing the news of her husband's death. But the narrator makes a point to describe Mr. Mallard as having kind, tender hands and a face that had never looked save with love upon Louise. So then why does this young woman now pray that her life might be long when only yesterday she shuddered at the thought of it? What is she so relieved of? Marriage. So let's talk about what marriage was like for women at this time, because I think it's crucial to understanding the range of changes that Mrs. Mallard experiences in this story, from her depression over life, to the profound joy over her newfound freedom, to her sudden death. Marriage was a legally binding contract that brought with it a whole slew of restrictions and obligations to women. In this patriarchal society, wives were made to be economically dependent on their husbands. Not only that, but a woman was legally required to relinquish control of her person and her property to her husband. And she was, under the law, technically her husband's servant, in that she was obligated to take care of the home and children. That was her job. And a woman was legally more like a babysitter than a parent, since all children legally belonged to the husband. Now, a husband did not only have full control over his children, he also had exclusive rights to his wife's body. In other words, a wife had no right to refuse sex because she was expected to bear children and the law did not recognize marital rape. Aren't you so glad that you're not a married woman in the 19th century? Well, so is Mrs. Mallard. Even though her husband was a kind man and she loved him at times, she was nevertheless still defined and restricted by the marital laws that saw her more as property and labor than as a human being. Knowing this context, we can see why Mrs. Mallard would involuntarily repeat the word free, 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 and would be so ecstatic to belong to and live only for herself. And you don't even necessarily have to be subjected to these extreme 19th century restrictions to feel limited in marriage. Even today, marriage is a legal and social contract. As a society, we have many expectations of what a marriage should be and look like, and I think it can be rather restrictive on some people. Time alone becomes more limited for both partners, and I think many people feel that they lose their individuality or sense of self in marriage. So Louise Mallard's desire to live for herself is not all that unusual even today. One line that I think is worth pointing out is there would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. So it seems that Chopin may not be criticizing the nature of 19th century marriage, but marriage as an institution at large that does affect both parties. In other words, no one should be legally bound to anyone else or feel they have a right to dictate the direction of another person's life.
Notice that this whole story takes place within the home, a woman's place, a very confined space, especially compared to a man's place, the public sphere, which is basically the rest of the world. After crying over her husband, Mrs. Mallard rushes to her room to be alone, where her sister and her husband's friend believe she is still grieving privately over her husband's death. But really, Louise begins to rejoice in her newfound freedom as she sits before an open window where she sees what will now belong more to her, an entire world full of life and more opportunity. As an unmarried woman, Louise is still held in check by the patriarchal society in which she lives. But as Sarah Ziegler explains in her article, Wifely Duties, a woman like Louise, who is now widowed, can manage, mortgage, and sell property. She can enter into contracts, run businesses, and engage in wage labor and use her earnings as she pleases. And if she were a mother, she would gain legal parental control over her children. But if she remarried, she would lose all these rights. I think you can see more easily why Mrs. Mallard dreaded life as a married woman and dies at the sight of her husband. This is called the story of an hour for a couple of reasons, I think. One, Mrs. Mallard feels the joy of freedom for literally one hour. It really is a cruel irony because she never actually was free. Her husband never died and so her marriage was always intact. Really, this whole story is just a fictive daydream, one in which Louise revels in for an hour. In fact, the story was originally published under a different title, The Dream of an Hour. And two, when Louise is under the impression that she's free, she feels a joy that she's never felt before, but her joy and freedom are so finite. This false hour is all a woman gets. And I say false because her presumed freedom never really was. This reminds me of something that a former professor told me years ago. He said, remember, the only time a woman in a patriarchal society belongs to herself is literally in the seconds when her father releases his hand from hers before the woman's groom takes it at the altar in marriage. And I think this is why our protagonist goes from being referred to as Mrs. Mallard, a signifier that she belongs to Mr. Mallard, to her first name, Louise, a name that belongs only to her. It's in her moments of freedom that she's known as Louise. And when Mr. Mallard returns, Mrs. Mallard is referenced not as Louise, but as his wife. You might think about how society or the law define you based on a certain identity that you carry and how those restrictions hold you back, make you who you are, or create in you desires that you hope to achieve in the future. In other words, can you identify with Louise Mallard at any point in the story? The narrator wants you to empathize with her or at the very least sympathize with her. Now, the dramatic irony is in full force when Mr. Mallard returns home, totally not dead. We've known all along that Mrs. Mallard suffers from a heart condition, so the doctors explain that upon seeing her husband, Mrs. Mallard died of a heart disease, of the joy that kills. Remember that dramatic irony is when the reader knows something important that other characters in the story don't. So while they all think Mrs. Mallard died from an overwhelming sense of happiness at the sight of her husband, who is alive and well, we understand that she dies of knowing that her newfound freedom never was and never will be, that she will be forced back into her wifely duties, that she still belongs to another. This is really quite a sad story, less so that one woman dies at the loss of her freedom and more so that this restrictive life really was the reality of most women in the 19th century. Chopin doesn't have to condemn marriage explicitly. She allows us to recognize its problems through the roller coaster of emotions that Louise Mallard experiences in a mere couple of pages. I hope you found this lecture useful in your studies of the story of an hour, and I would love to hear your ideas and thoughts on what I've discussed. Be sure to check out my other videos for more easy to understand lectures and subscribe to my channel so that you'll be notified when the next lecture is posted. Until then, take care, be well, and I will see you then.